Hi guys, welcome to Phys Ed Summit and thanks for joining in to uh, watch my presentation and hang out for a little while. Uh, my name is Gina Lang. I am a middle school health and PE teacher in Liberty, Missouri, which is just outside of Kansas City. Um, I've taught here for, oh gosh, 10 years, I think. Prior to that, I was an elementary health teacher for nine years. Um, I have also worked in the district at the high school level as an athletic trainer. So I've had experience with all the ages of the kids within our district. Um, also part of my job is I am the district curriculum chair for health and PE at the middle level, um, which means I get to do a lot of the curriculum leading of the cur curriculum writing presentations for our staff professional development for our staff, that kind of thing. I am also um, part of the OER implementation team, which stands for Open Educational Resources. And I'll talk about that um, as we get into the presentation a little bit. So today I'm gonna do um, a little bit on health and what we do in health in our district and specifically in my classroom. A lot of this will be geared towards middle level. However, it can be tailored for high school and elementary school. So I hope that you can find a bunch of ideas from here to take with you um, and use in your classrooms as we uh, get back into the school year next year or even um, in virtual uh, times right now. All right. Oops. Okay, so like I said, I am part of our OER team within our district and that means that we are a content area that does not use a textbook. About, gosh, I think it was four or five years ago now, we were at the process of having to choose a textbook. We were up for our textbook yet. Um, renewal uh, so we had to make a decision on whether what textbook we want to go with at that point our district some of the content areas within our district had gone to no textbook meaning they create um, and utilize free and open resources all over the internet in order to teach their content area and so we pulled together a group of teachers within our district um, one from each middle school building and we kind of hashed out the idea and talked through it a little bit. And you'll see in this picture over here, this was kind of part of our brainstorming session. Um, at that time, we'd also decided that we wanted to go to skills-based health and kind of change up the way that we teach. Now, when we teach health in our district right now, we're teaching the skills, but we're infusing content in there. So our primary thing is teaching them decision-making, goal-setting, analyzing influences, those type of things. And we're sticking the content that we're used to teaching back in there. Um, assessments, you'll see as we kind of talk, are most of the time on the skills and then some of the time on the content. So basically our, um, the curriculum group that met decided this was the, uh, the direction we would like to go and then we took it back to our buildings and let every um, teacher within the four buildings have a say in what they wanted to do. And it was um, an overwhelming yes, that people want to go without the textbook because we're finding as we start to get into the textbook, things become outdated and we're not even really utilizing them uh, to the max that we could be. And so it becomes a place where our district can put the money other places. So our curriculum is totally free and available for anybody to use. It is all teacher created and pulling in different resources from the internet, but a lot of it is teacher created. Um, so you'll find the link right here and it is always open and free for you guys to use. You can go in and make copies of things. Um, we can't give you editing access, but you can go ahead and make copies of anything that you wanna use and know that it is a working document. We are always working to change better um, and improve what we do. So you're welcome to use that um, at any time. Okay, so this is, um, this, I have a bunch of video clips in here that I wanted to show you and use. And as they were uploading this presentation, I was getting blocked on everything. So you will see a lot of things in here that I will tell you there's a clip to go with it. And the clips are in the file sections of where you can find them to go along with this presentation. So my original presentation, the slides and all of that are in the file section and everything will have the clips that go with it. So anywhere it says links and files, that's where you'll find it. Um, I am a big believer in telling my students the why behind everything. I think back to when I was in high school and college and I was a runner and I ran track and cross country. And I remember being told today we're gonna to do five 800s or we're gonna do four one mile repeats. I never understood why. I thought it was just, that was our workout day and this is what I'm gonna do because this is what my coach is telling me to do. 
as I got older and I started to take control of the running that I do and the workouts that I do, I started to understand the why behind those repeat 800s and those repeat miles and those speed work drills that I had to do. And so um, that has brought a lot into my teaching. And I am a huge believer in always telling my kids why. Um, so there's this great video clip called The Why that's out there um, where this presenter tells the guy in the audience to sing Amazing Grace. And so he sings it. And then he gives them, he said, that's great. You're, you've got some talent. You're a good singer. And then he said, I want you to sing it now like this. And he gives them like a feeling that he needs to feel as he sings it. And then he goes on and sings it a second time. And it is completely different Amazing Grace than the first time he sang. Um, the audience is standing, people are clapping, everybody's in awe because when this guy had a reason and had a why for what he was singing, it was so much more meaningful and so much better. And I think that goes along with education too. And so especially when I'm teaching skills-based health, I'm giving them the why all the time because they're going to be like, why do we have to do decision making? Why do we have to talk about goal setting again? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. And I try to give those to my kids every time. And so I'll present some of that to you guys too today. These are the national health standards. They should look familiar to most of you, I hope. I am going to go through four of them today. I have activities that go with the other three, but um, due to time, I'm just going to kind of give you all of my activities that I've done for analyzing influences, accessing information, interpersonal communication, and decision making. And then I'll show you how we weaved in some of the content to go with that. Okay, decision making. These are the skill cues, and I start every unit um, with some sort of um, kind of catch for the kids to get in hooked in and to um, get the reason why we're doing that activity. So you'll see down here, there is a clip from a famous TV show um, that is phenomenal. And my kids love this show. They, um, they just, anytime I can show clips from this or a few other shows that they are just zoned into it. And so in this clip, they have a big old drill that happens and everybody starts to go crazy and everybody's running around and there's no real plan. There's no real idea what to do. Nobody's really taking control of the situation. So we watch that and then we talk through um, were good decisions made in this video clip or not. And so we, that's how we introduce the decision making model and the decide model. We determine the problem. They find out that there was a fire. They examine the options. They see a ton of different options that happen within this clip. Um, we don't talk at this time of whether or not they're good or bad options. They're just looking at all the options that are happening. Then they're gonna consider the consequences. So they're gonna look at, and we talk about a lot about positive and negative. What are some positive things that happened when they did this or could do this? And what are some negative things that happen? Identify values or influences, which is really tough. Um, values is a big word for sixth grader and seventh grader and even eighth grader to understand. So we dig into that a little bit and then talk about the influence it could have. Talk about the healthy decision, healthiest decision that they can make. And then and this one, we kind of go through and say, well, were there really any healthy decisions that were made? And then evaluate the outcome, which we can actually do in this because uh, they get to kind of see how the whole thing wraps up at the end. So I'm a big believer in using um, any sort of TV, movie, um, any sort of video clips to kind of hook them in to what we're going to talk about. And then we get into lots of different activities. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of some of the activities that we do within my class uh, that are free and out there for you to use and that my kids love. So this year, we uh, did a couple different breakout activities. Um, in the past, I've had breakout boxes, and I got all the locks, and I set them all up, and we had um, a different scenario that they had to get through to get their box open. And in the process, they had to use the, just the steps of the decide model in order to get their box opened, and they would work in groups to do that. Uh, this year when I was planning that part, I saw there's a ton of electronic kind of breakout rooms out there. And so I found a great one on Teacher Pay Teachers that you'll have to pay for, um, but it's kind of different puzzles they have to solve. And so I kind of set them up in groups and give them envelopes and they have to go through one envelope and solve the problem and show me that they got it. And then they get to move on to the next envelope. And I talked to them a lot about 
yes, everything in the envelope has to do with the bullying because that was the content that we were putting in with um, decision making at that point. But what I'm really watching for is how your group is interacting and how you're using the decide model to solve your uh, breakout activity. And so as I walk around the room, that's the thing I'm looking for. I'm looking at their conversations. I'm looking, are you talking about the positives and negatives that could happen? Um, are you listening to everybody's opinion? That kind of thing. So super fun activity. They love anything that's a breakout activity. And there's tons of them out there. There's even some that are more electronic that they can do on their computers if you're a one-to-one -one, um, building. Brain games. Well, let's start here. The, after I've done the video, I um, really get into the team brain. And we talk a lot about the why behind how they make kids make decisions. And I have an, a fantastic um, family and child counselor um, in our district, well, in our city that works with our district. And she comes in, we are so lucky that she gets to talk with the teachers and help train us so that we can train, get the information so we can help our kids more. And so a lot of this PowerPoint that I have created is a lot of her information. Um, we go through and talk about, again, the why of why they're going to learn about their brain. And we talk about the different parts of their brain. So their brain stem, and then we get into their limbic system, and all the way through really focusing on things like the amygdala and the frontal lobe. And so we use a lot of the hand model with that too, knowing that at their age, the frontal lobe is not fully developed until probably the age of 24 or 25. And so when their amygdala re reacts, um, a lot of times their frontal lobe can't filter what happens. And so I talked to them a lot about when they're making decisions that that frontal lobe doesn't always allow them to take a break, take a breather and make a good decision. And so we're gonna learn about the decision-making process so that and repeat it over and over so that hopefully when the time for a decision comes, you'll be able to take a deep breath, calm your um, amygdala down, use your frontal lobe a little bit more because that's more of a um, thing that's set inside of your head. It's a more of a, a constant that you know, hey, when I have to make a decision, I need to use this process. And so we go through all the different parts of the brain and talk about, oops, and talk about why and how it happens um, and that kind of thing. So I think that's super important before I talk about decision making that um, they understand that uh, and then we go into some uh, brain games, which are super fun. Um, and these are links to some of our favorite ones, and I'll put those up on the screen. And this is a great way to end, end a day, um, especially if you have a few minutes left in class, where they're able to um, play some of these games. Our favorite one is Guess the Color, which is like that mastermind game that they, I played when I was younger, where you have the little... Um, it's like a long board, and then there's four spots for pegs, and then hiding underneath the one up here is um, like a combination of four different pegs. So it could be like red, white, red, white, or blue, 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 and anyway, they get their different chances along the way to make their, um, try to decide what is hiding underneath the little hiding spot. And so we play that as a class because we can put it up on the screen so that everybody can see it. So that's a super fun activity that um, my kids love. All right, uh, as far as a, a project, this is a decision-making project that we do. And this is their planning sheet. And so uh, they have to write a scenario in which a character needs to make a decision. And then they have to give that information um, and to show the rest of the class kind of what what was your situation? What was the decision that had to be made? And they can demonstrate that through lots of different ways. And so I've offered them how tunes. Um, we did a choose your own adventure one time where a lot of kids wrote little stories that went along with it so that the reader could kind of choose their own adventures along the way. Slideshows, prezzies, oh, lots of role playing skits that they like to do, um, comic strips. And I even had a few kids do monologues where they kind of wrote out a whole one page paper and recited the monologue. And the idea behind this was to be able to give it to younger kids so that they could work on how to make a decision. And so we would be able to send that down to, I think at the time I had a kiddo in fourth, my own kiddo in fourth grade, and we'd send that down to his classroom to look at and to use. Um, so it was kind of fun, but this is their project sheet to help them through it. 
and then their final project was whatever um, they wanted to create to demonstrate their information. Okay, and then as far as I talked about adding some PE things into here because <clears throat> we try to carry what we're doing in health into PE too as much as we can. And I saw this um, from Rachel on uh, Twitter at one time and so we took it and adapted it to what we were doing in class. And so I'm fortunate that I have a full weight room and with dumbbells and just a lot of benches and a lot of space for the girls to be in. And so I created a choose your own adventure workout for them and they worked their way through using their decision making process and what their body needs and what their fitness needs at that point to do the different workout. And so we just start off, everybody start off with 50 jumping jacks and then it broke off from there and they had to make decisions based on what their body needed. It's a great warm up. It's a great full day activity. You can change it to fit what you have available in your school and what your kids are used to. Okay, interpersonal communication this year, I combined it with um, decision making only because I kind of heard what was coming with this um, COVID stuff. And so I wanted to make sure I was able to get all of my health stuff in before we went on spring break because we didn't know what um, would happen after spring break. And so it, those two combined worked perfectly this year and I kind of liked it and may do it again. But on its own, I'll show you some of the activities that we did. And so I love this one because I think it fits in so well with middle schoolers. Um, when we go through all of these steps, identify their feelings, tell them, express using I statements and we practice those I statements because it's hard for them to use it and hard for them to think on the spot. Looking at the person um, when especially we did a puzzle activity with this one and they had to be able to look at the person while they were talking because I find so many times their head is down, their head is looking around the room and so really trying to take more of their attention and looking at that person listening to the responses, appropriate body language, so you're not slumped in your seat, arms aren't crossed, and we go through lots of those different ideas, and we do a lot of role play with this. Um, Open-minded and then assertive communication. Uh, so I use, there's so many parts to interpersonal communication, and I use, um, again, some more video clips to help drive home the points for my kids. So when we are talking about verbal and nonverbal communication, I use a great clip um, from this show, and uh, it is set up especially for this. And so you can imagine in that show that some of the people have some really great nonverbal communication, and they're funny, and the kids know this show because they're watching it on Netflix, or we're watching it on Netflix, um, and so they kind of get into this too. But it's a really blatant way to drive home what nonverbal communication is. And after we show that um, as an exit ticket that day, I would give them this. Comes. So they just have to be able to tell me what is a verbal message they've given today? What is a nonverbal message they've given? What is a verbal message they have received? And what is a nonverbal message they have received? And so, um, especially at middle school, we'll talk a lot about eye rolling or hugs or high fives as being good nonverbal messages. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. All right, and then as far as verbal communication, we they obviously know that this is when they talk and the words that they say. And I dry, like to talk to them a lot about how sometimes in my head, I really think that I'm teaching really well and I'm explaining it to the kids really well and everybody's understanding it and it's going awesome. And then I give them a little quiz and I find out nobody understood or nobody got it. And a lot of that is because our... Um, my verbal communication is not what they need. And so we watch this clip here from a famous late night show. And again, this is linked on the files. And um, it's who's on first, the kind of little bannering joke back and forth that they do. And the kids start to understand, okay, this person is talking and this person knows what they're saying. However, that person is not understanding. And so we talk a lot about how to, a lot our words mean things and how we have to really think about what the words are that we're going to say. Um, one of the huge things for middle school people is role playing. And I think role playing is super important in teaching the skills because <clears throat> it is what, 
the best way for me to assess if kids are understanding the skill that I'm teaching and the steps of the skill. And so I give them a whole bunch of different scenarios and they get to work with a friend or two friends and they get to act this out for the class. And they have to figure out what they would do kind of using the whole, um, the process of talking back and forth. And um, with uh, the one we did recently, they had to use the decision-making process too, but really I'm looking for on this one, uh, do you have all those interpersonal communication skills? Are you looking at the person? Are you talking in a calm voice? Are you using open body language? All of that. All right. Oops. See if I can get this to switch better. I apologize. There we go. Um, this is a super fun online quiz that's totally free to use. Um, I've done it with my girls, of me standing at the front of the room, and I've also done it having them work in groups. Basically, what it is is it will give them, I think it's 14 or 15 facial expressions, and then it will give them three choices of how that person is feeling. So maybe for this one, it would be like, is she happy? Is she excited? Is she loved? And then they have to go in and they have to click which one they think it is. Regardless of whether they get it right or wrong, it then tells them what about that facial expression that made them, that made that person, that shows that that person is having that emotion. Um, and <clears throat> I think it's super cool to see because they don't always read I, the it, facial expressions right. And for kids, that's huge because that's how they're all communicating. They'll think somebody has their face down or in their head down and their corner of their lips are kind of turned down and they're really, really mad. But that person might just be sad. And especially in middle school, they are drawing upon kids' emotions right away just by looking at them. And so this helps us to talk about, hey, you can't always tell how somebody is feeling just by looking at their face. Because look, you got five right on this quiz out of 15. And so we have to dig deeper than just looking at somebody. And then the last activity we did was a whole book of conflict resolution games. And this whole book is totally free on the internet and the link is here for you guys to use. I use an activity called On the Run. And um, we, uh, they have to go in and there's like different categories and then things that go underneath each category. So I might say like, you have to find the person's name, the type of shoe that they run in, why they exercise and how old they are. And so it gives you all of these and gives you some clues and then you have to match up the person to go with each of their things. A lot of communication that has to happen in there. And then I have them afterwards reflect on how their group did based on um, the skill cues for interpersonal communication. All right, even more speed greeting. This is linked here. This is one I found on Twitter and I do not recall who it was from. I use this at the beginning of the school year, so not even in my interpersonal communication unit, but I'll bring it back then and talk about, hey, this is what we did and why we did it. Um, where they have to spend, I think it's like two minutes with one person and they have a whole list of questions that they have to quickly go through and ask each other. So a great way for them to look, listen, shake their head and say yes. Um, we did a PBL project to go along with interpersonal communication. So how can you spread positive messages about bullying with people in our school? And that was our driving question. And so you can see here, here's um, some of the things that they came up with. We had some go on Snapchat, we had some go on Instagram, we had some people do posters, we had some people make videos. Um, just a great way for them to practice what they're learning. Uh, let's see. I think the rest of these are PE type activities. Outdoor scavenger hunt is an activity that I have linked here where they have to communicate with each other to go through 20 different tasks in PE. And we have a, um, a large open area at our school out in our, um, like we have a football field and a tennis court area and they can go out and run around and they have different things they have to do. Like maybe they have to go form their body into the letter H by a white building. So they have to run over by our shed and make their bodies into an H. So lots of communication. Um, in doing this too. Team building activities. I had one day this year where I just did not have a normal PE class and we did all team building activities because I was seeing within our activities that we were doing that our communication was not there and kids were struggling to get along with each other. We're having some drama creep into class and so bringing in team building activities was an, a great way for me to do that. 
speedball. It's a combination of kind of like basketballs, football, handball all together, which requires a huge amount of communication because you get three passes to get your, um, or three steps with the ball, and then you must pass it off while people are playing defense around you. Um, so that's the game there that we play that we talk a lot about communication um, when we're playing that game. And then over here, we did, um, we always have a warm up at the beginning of PE. And so I had my girls create warm up plans based on what their bodies needed. And I put them into small groups and they had to work together to fill out this form. So what um, part of fitness were they working and then go through their whole warm up activity that they would want to do. And so they wrote it and then each day they would do that together. All right, accessing information. Is it accurate? Is it credible? Is it current? Is it easy to use? What or situations is it used best in? I have found that a lot of my kids come in with a ton of background in this skill. Our librarian and our ELA teachers are huge in helping kids to understand how to do this. So when they're doing research papers or they're just searching the internet for information that they might need for ELA. And so I am able to really um, dig into this even deeper with my kids because they already get it. And I'm even able to dig more into the content that we're pulling in with this. So it's, a, I would say, really um, was a smart idea for me to pre-test my kids after the first year seeing like, hey, they already know what I'm doing. So I kind of pre-test them when they come into this unit and then we adjust from there um, on how we're gonna proceed through the unit. So activities that I've used, another great um, link is here. It's um, on, shows a bunch of different real things that could happen in the news and then fake things that happen in the news and kind of gives them some little tips to figure out whether things are fake or if they're real. So a fun little video to watch with that. And then I give them the assignment to go with it or a follow up to that. And they have to go to, oops, I'm sorry, there's the video. I'll link the assignment that goes with it. They have to go to, oh, here it is. They have to go to these three sites and they have to decide whether that site is fake or if it's real, just based on what we know at the beginning of how to in, um, access information and then what is their evidence. And so they're always showing me, I think this is fake because I have never seen a purple panda bear or whatever it may be that is on there. Prove it is something I'll do at the end of class sometimes where I put up different scenarios. So I have, I have different things that go along with nutrition because we tie in a lot of nutrition things with this unit. And so I may say, chicken nuggets are made of real chicken. They must go and prove it. And so I remind them of the steps that they have to have as to determine whether their site they're getting their information from is a credible site and it's a good site for them to be at and then they would prove to me that this is true or false and then prove to me from their site that they chose how they got that information so i have just a bunch of them written down here that maybe at the end of class if i had a few minutes i would throw one of those into um, the activity that we're doing food label search because we pull nutrition into this, um, so we're looking at accessing information off of a food label, so trying to make this as real life for them as we can. So I give them food labels, we have buckets of them, um, they pick out one and they have to go in and look at how many carbs, fats, and proteins are in them, and then try to categorize them. Evaluating the site. This is um, a great one that Hall Hallie Alpern and Sarah Bennis had in their book, and I took it and modified it a little bit for my students because I found that my kids needed it to be, a, to be a little bit more simple. And so as we're going through the different parts of um, looking at a website, they will go through here and just click yes, no, or I don't know. And so this kind of guides them through the site so that they can determine whether or not it's a good site for them to be able to use for the activity that we are doing. Um, so I took what they had and just modified it for my classes to make it a little simpler. And then at the end, it will show you, oh, snap. it will say, was this a good, is this a good site for us to use and help? Why or why not? And they have to be able to tell me their information. And finally, they do a little food hunt where uh, they have to go and find 
correct information. So here we go. You need to buy a healthy snack to take to school. It must be peanut free because one of your friends is allergic. Use the food labels to determine the best snack to purchase and explain three reasons why you chose the snack that you did. And so there again, having to go find a site on the internet and using their access skill cues and then determining whether that's a good site for them to use and then being able to answer the question. Down at the bottom, um, you'll see there's their little checklist to help them determine whether or not that site was a good one for them to use. All right, more accessing information. Uh, final activity that we did, which was kind of fun because they got to go in and look at the food that is eaten in our cafeteria. So our school website puts all the nutrition information for our foods that are served in the cafeteria online. And so they are able to go into that site, um, determine whether or not they think it is accurate, reliable, that kind of thing. But then they have to go and look at list, list one food um, here that would be the most unhealthy lunch choice you can make. They chose the food that because their evidence search for websites that back up the claim. So I can't just say, well, because um, it looked like on this website, it had 30 grams of fat. Well, I want them to go find another website to help prove that they, that this food is unhealthy for them. And then their reasoning. So like I said at the beginning, because my kids have so much background and accessing information, I am able to dig a little bit deeper into the nutrition aspect of this with them. And I love that. Uh, let's see, we use a lot of the youth behavior risk survey. So I will take those and post them up around the room for whatever we're doing. And that's a way for them to go access different types of information, especially in the graph format or um, like the color coded state format that is out there too. Create your own game is something we did in PE as a fun activity at the end of the year where they got to take ideas from all the games that we have used so far this year and we'll give them a bunch of different websites that are out there that have PE teachers that have put games out and they need to go create their own game. And so they have a format that they have to follow, which is linked here. And they have to list the goal of the game, how to play it, equipment that is needed, rules, um, just different things that could go along with the game and then they get to create their own game. So they're really accessing information from what we've done in class, but then also they have to go out and find other games that exist and see if they can create one on their own with it. And then they take this and put it into a little video. Just like you'll see on some of the Hello, today I'm gonna to be teaching you how to play Nutrition Chaos. So there are six different nutrition labels, wheat, fruit, dairy, veggies, oils, and protein. And the goal is to have one whole team be in your three hula hoops. So once someone says go, people are gonna start coming out of, of their sections. And so super fun for them to create it like that and then they get to teach it to the class and be the teacher that day and play their activity with the class. And we may have two games in one day, uh, just to fit them all in. But fun way for them to kind of be the teacher for the day. I have also used accessing information when we're in the weight room and having my girls create their own workout. And so I may say, like I did here on this day, you need to do three sets of 10 of an arm exercise, a shoulder exercise, a core exercise, and then arm, um, chest, core. And they have to go through and pick. So then I give them websites Oh, that's their chart that they can go put it in. So they would write their activity here, upper body, lower body, and then track it that way. And I give them a whole bunch of websites um, in which they can go to, to help them come up with different weight lifting moves that they could do in the weight room. In our weight room, they've already had a background in it and I've given them a lot of different exercises that they can use, but I love for them to go onto any of these sites so that they can um, see how they would do it if they're out in the real world without me near them. So if they're at home over the summer, if they're at home right now, which is what we've kind of been working on through virtual learning, they're able to use these sites to help create their own workouts. And then one thing that was very fun is we took a current event article and it was about cell phone use and read it in class one day. 
So they accessed information out of this cell phone article and then they ha chose to apply it to their lives. And I love how they chose here and that this group of girls um, wanted to set up a challenge for themselves that they would stay off their phones for 24 hours. I had another group that said they were gonna stay off social media for a week. And so it's fun to see them take the information they learned and then put it into practice. And then we have a big discussion afterwards about, hey, the article was right. There are some good points on the article of why I maybe shouldn't be on my phone as often as I am. So super fun activity to do with them. All right, analyzing influences. Here are our tips, our skill cues that we're gonna go through as we go through and analyze the different influences in our life. And probably one of my most favorite units to teach with them because we're really able to dig in and say, hey, these people or these things are really good in my life or these people and these things aren't so good in my life and having them get that realization. So some of the activities that we do, um, there is a great video clip that is um, Teens Influencing Teens and it's about a 16 year old that decides that she wants to change the way that um, other teenagers think of themselves. And so she goes around and tells everybody that they're beautiful and videotapes their reaction to see how that positive influence in their life makes such a big difference. And so I showed that at the start of this unit and it completely kind of changed our path a little bit and the girls wanted to go out and be able to do stuff like that for other people so they realized hey that uh, people do think poorly about themselves and people don't think that they're pretty and that we're always looking at the negative things about ourselves and they wanted to start to promote the positive things about ourselves with people and help people to do that and so they um worked one day to create uh different ways that they could do that spreading kindness around the school and it was so cool to see all the different ideas. We had some new videos. We had some kids just go out and talk to other people. We had them go talk to teachers and tell teachers that they, the nice compliments that they could say to them, that they're beautiful, that they love having them as a teacher, that they're the kindest person that they've met. Um, we did post-it notes. We had great big posters that hung around. And then there were some that did social media campaigns. So a way for them to take this and use it in their life. Uh, we use a lot of scenarios again so that they can do role play. And so here is a scenario and they had to read through this and then um, work on analyzing the whole thing and consider a plan to help this person. So a lot of different um, real life examples that I try to pull in for them and then have them act out or really think about and be able to um, talk about. This is my group that did the no social media. So they were the ones that I even got emails from parents afterwards, like this is the coolest activity. I'm so glad you did this. Uh, and then this is a video that some of my girls made that was on beautiful where they went around and talked to the different kids in the school about being beautiful. Um, the final activity I have them do in this is I give them a sheet that says they are gonna analyze analyze the influence of classmates in the school. And so they're gonna go through the steps and talk about how it is impacts each of their day, what thoughts are in their head, is it a positive or negative, which I see both of the answers come out, um, and then <clears throat> dig a little bit deeper into it. And the things that I saw from them as they came back with these, just, I mean, I guess I knew that they, thought about this things in this way, but it just drove home a whole lot more points where that if I don't make everything perfect, people will not like me or people won't follow me on Instagram or people won't sit by me at lunch. Um, that I think it affects me a lot of how people think about me. And so it's really, really eye-opening for me to read the responses. But then at the end, I always have them consider a plan. And so if they think it's a negative influence in their life, they're going to talk about three things they can do to lessen that negative influence. If they think it's a positive influence in their life, they're going to talk about what are three ways that I can be a positive influence to others so that others feel good about themselves in this way. Um, and so really getting them to think how they can use this in their life, I think is super important to what um, they do. All right.
thank you so much for being here. Um, I have a ton more ideas and a ton of things that I can share with you and always love to collaborate, share ideas, make ideas better, see what people are doing and then tweak them to fit my needs in my school. So I love any feedback that you have or anytime you wanna share information. Um, I'm huge on Twitter. I love to get on there and share what I'm doing in my class. So I'd love if you would follow along, but then I would love to follow you back so that I can see some of the things that you're doing with your kids that I can do with mine too. So I hope there are things that were useful in here for you. Remember that um, a lot of the clips I was going to share and things like that are all uploaded in the files section that I believe that they're going to share with you or give you access to. Um, so you can go in and see those and watch those and see how they fit. Um, as anytime I can use TV, media, um, movies, anything like that, and just short clips. Uh, the girls seem to love it and it seems to drive home what I'm trying to teach with them so much better. So I thank you for your time. Um, I hope to hear from you and I hope um, that you have a great day.